welcome. This is part two of the building and operating system series. Today we'll learn how to load stuff from a floppy disk. Before talking about today's topic, I would like to correct some mistakes I made in the first episode. First of all, I said that the move instruction moves from the left to the right, which is incorrect. Move moves from right to left. You can think of it as an assignment in C. The destination is on the left side and the source is on the right side. Also in the referencing a memory location section, I said that when the segment is not specified, DS is used by default. This is mostly correct. However, as the viewer pointed out, when the base register is BP, SS will be the default. So far we've been limited to the first sector of a floppy disk, which is 512 bytes. This is very little space. We haven't reached the limit yet, but after today's episode we won't be far from it. So our number one priority is to implement some code which will load the rest of the operating system into memory. What this means is that we will have to split our operating system in two modules. The first one will load the second one. All operating systems are actually split this way, because 512 bytes is not enough to fit even the most basic functions of an operating system. The first module is called a bootloader, and generally speaking it has several functions. It loads the most essential components of the operating system into memory, it puts the computer in the state that the kernel expects it to be in, and it collects some basic information about the system. Depending on the operating system, the bootloader can be very simple or very complex. Older operating systems, like MS-DOS, ran in 16-bit real mode, the mode we're using right now. So the bootloader's job was quite simple, to just load some binary and run it. More modern operating systems typically expect the bootloader to make the switch to 32-bit protected mode for them, and also collect some system information. We haven't talked a lot about 32-bit protected mode yet, but we will get there, I promise. However, one of its main limitations is that the BIOS functions that we talked about in part 1 can no longer be used. Some of these functions are really important as they provide us with critical information. For example, there is a function which shows us the memory layout, which parts of the memory are safe to use and which parts are reserved by hardware. Calling these functions is not possible once we are in 32-bit protected mode, so the responsibility falls upon the bootloader to collect all the required information before it starts the main kernel. A note here, by not possible, I mean possible, but we need to set up a lot of stuff until we get there, and we need that information a lot sooner than that, which is why I say it's not possible. Now that we know what we're going to be working on, let's talk a bit about floppy disks. Why in the world are we talking about floppy disks in 2021? That's a very good question. When getting started working on an operating system, a floppy disk is the simplest form of disk storage we can work with. It is universally supported by all BIOSes, as well as all virtualization software. Creating and working with disk images is very easy, and the FAT12 file system is rudimentary simple. All of these make it ideal for making operating systems, at least until we learn the basics and we can move to other storage devices. The simplest way in which we could use a disk would be to have the bootloader in the first sector, or the boot sector, and the rest of the operating system starting from sector 2. This would be quite easy to implement. Our bootloader would read a number of sectors into memory, and then start executing them. The problem with this approach is that we wouldn't be able to use the disk for storing any files, which is not very useful. We could design our own file system around that, but it's probably a better idea to use an existing standard one like FAT or EXT or NTFS so that we can easily exchange data between our operating system and other operating systems like Windows and Linux. Let's get back to the code and continue from where we left off in part 1. This time I decided to use Visual Studio Code as the editor with the x86-64 assembly extension installed. Since we want to split our code into two modules, Let's do that right now. I created two different directories in our source directory, one for the bootloader and one for the kernel. I put the same source file that we worked on in part 1 in both folders. Next we need to make some changes to our make file. To keep things organized, I declared some phony targets. This way we can keep our make file cleaner by referring to various modules 
just in their names rather than their output file names. Then I added a rule to tell make that the phony floppy image target depends on the actual file main floppy.img. In the floppy image dependencies, I replaced main.bin with the bootloader and the kernel targets. Next, I added the rules for building the bootloader. The always target will be used for creating the build directory if it doesn't exist, so we don't get compilation errors if the directory doesn't exist. For the build rules, it's really simple. We just call nasm like we did before. For now, to build the bootloader and the kernel, the steps are identical, so I just added the same rules for the kernel. Next, I created the always target, which simply creates the build directory if it doesn't exist. And the clean target will simply delete everything in the build folder. Let's give this a go and see what happens. Looks like we got an error when creating the floppy image. Ah yes, I forgot to change the file names in the main floppy.img rules. Talking about the floppy image, let's modify the way we create the image so that we actually create a FAT12 disk image. First, we need to generate an empty 1.44 megabyte file. We can do that using the dd command with the block size set to 512 and the block count set to 2880. The next step is to create the file system using the mkfs.fat command. The dash f12 argument tells it to use fat12 and dash n is used for the label, which doesn't really matter since we will overwrite it anyway. Next, we need to put the bootloader in the first sector of the disk. The simplest way to do that is to use the d command with the conv equals no trunk option, which tells the d not to truncate the file, otherwise we will lose the rest of the image. Now that we have a file system, we can copy the files to the image. One option could be to mount the image, but I don't really like doing that because we would have to run the image generation with elevated privileges. Fortunately, there's a collection of tools called mTools, which contains a bunch of utilities that we can use to manipulate fat disk images directly without having to mount them. To copy the kernel.bin file to the disk, we can use the mcopy command. Our makefile is now finished, so let's give it another go. And we're getting another error now. mcopy is complaining that the disk image is not valid. What happened? The issue here is that we have overwritten the first sector of the image with our bootloader. This section contains some important headers used by FAT12, so by overwriting them we have broken the file system. Can we fix this? Yes, we just need to add these headers to our bootloader. Going to the article about the FAT file system on the OS Dev Wiki, there's this section which describes all the fields that are required for a valid FAT file system. What we need to do is add all of them to our bootloader. To help us figure out what the values of these headers should be, I have created a test.img disk image using the same steps as in the make file but without overwriting the boot sector. By opening the file using a hex editor, we can figure out what the value of each field should be set to. Let's begin working on our bootloader. Looking at the documentation, there are two sections that we need to add, each containing a number of fields. The first one is called the BIOS parameter block. According to the documentation, the first three bytes must be a short jump instruction followed by a no op. So we can start with that. Next, we have the OEM identifier, which is an 8 byte string that is typically set by the tool used to format the disk. Looking at the image we created previously, this has been set to mkfs.fat. Theoretically, we can put anything here, but for maximum compatibility, we will just set it to MSWIN 4.1. The next field is a word indicating the number of bytes per sector, which for a standard 1.4 megabyte floppy is 512 bytes. Here it is in the disk image as well. Remember that this is little endian, so to read the numbers correctly, you have to read the bytes from right to left. In our case, the value is 0200 in hexadecimal, 
which in decimal is equal to 512. The number of sectors per cluster is 1. The number of reserved sectors is also 1. The FAT or the file allocation table count is 2. The directory entry count is E0 in hexadecimal. The total number of sectors is 2880, which multiplied by 512 bytes gives us the 1.44 megabytes. The media descriptor type indicates what type of disk this is. The value F0 hexadecimal indicates a 3.5 inch floppy disk. The number of sectors per FAT is 9. The number of sectors per track is 18. The head count is 2. The hidden sector count and the large sector count are both 0. The next section is called the extended boot record and contains a few extra fields. First we have the drive number which should be set to 0. This value is pretty much useless because moving the disk to a different drive would make its value incorrect. Next we have one reserved byte that should be simply set to 0. The signature should be set to either 28 hexadecimal or 29 hexadecimal. The volume ID is basically a 4 byte serial number, you can put anything you want here. The volume label is an 11 byte string, you can put anything here as long as it's padded with spaces. The system ID is an 8 byte string which should be set to FAT12, also padded with spaces. Now that we added all the required headers, we can test if make works. And it does. We can also verify that the disk contains our kernel by running the mdir command. Before beginning to implement our disk reading operation, it is useful to understand how data is laid out on these disks. This applies to all form of disks, floppies, CDs, DVDs and hard drives. Looking at the round disk, if we divide it into rings, each ring represents a track or a cylinder. Another way of dividing the platter is into pizza slices. These are called sectors. Floppy disks, as well as hard disks, can store data on both sides of the platter so we call each side a head. Hard disks can also have multiple platters, in which case we count each side of each platter as a head. To read or write something, we need a way to tell the disk controller where our data is. To read or write something, we need a way to tell the disk controller where our data is. So we can do that by giving it the cylinder number, the head number and the sector number. This addressing scheme is called a cylinder head sector, or CHS scheme. While this scheme might make sense when you need to determine physically where the data is located on the disk, it is not very useful for us. When working with disks, we don't really care where the data is physically located, we only care if it's at the beginning of the disk or the middle or the end. For that we can use the logical block addressing scheme or LBA. Instead of a triplet of numbers you only need one single number to reference a block on the disk. Unfortunately, the BIOS function we will use only supports CHS addressing, so we will have to make the conversion ourselves. Another thing I'd like to mention is that in most modern disks, the physical layout of the data has gotten a lot more complex, and the disk controllers only pretend to have cylinders, heads and sectors to maintain compatibility with this legacy addressing scheme, but they have their own methods of determining the physical location of the data. In the CHS scheme, the cylinder and head are indexed from 0, but the sector starts from 1. Taking this into consideration, we can come up with the following formulas for making the conversion. We have two constants. The number of sectors per track, or the number of sectors per cylinder, meaning how many sectors we can fit in a single track on a single side of the platter, and the number of heads per cylinder, which is simply the number of faces the entire disk has. The sector is obtained by taking the remainder of the logical block address divided by the number of sectors per track and then adding 1. 
For the head, we perform the same division, and this time we take the result and divide it again by the number of heads per cylinder, from which we take the remainder. The cylinder is calculated by taking the result of the last division, that is, the logical block address divided by the number of sectors per track, and then divided by the number of heads per cylinder. Let's write this into assembly. We will write a function which will take the LBA address in the AX register and to make things easier for us, we will store the result exactly how the BIOS function expects us to. So the cylinder will be in CX in bits 6 to 15, the sector will be in CX bits 0 to 5 and the head number will be in the DH register. We can begin by dividing the logical block address stored in AX by the number of sectors per track. That number is a word, so we need to clear DX because the div instruction divides DX AX to the word operand. After this division, we will have the result in AX and the remainder in DX. To finish calculating the sector, we need to increment the remainder by 1 and then we will put it in CX which is where the output should be. Next we performed a second division to the number of heads per cylinder. This will give us the cylinder in AX and the head in DX. Now we just need to shuffle the results so they are in the correct output registers. Since DL is the lower 8 bits of DX, we can simply move from DL to DH so that the head number is now in the H. The cylinder is a bit weird because it is split. This is what the CX register should look like. So we need to move the lower 8 bits into CH, which is the upper half of CX. For the upper 2 bits, we can shift them to the left by 6 positions and then OR the result to the CL register, which already contains the sector number. Now, to be nice, we will save the register that we modify and are not part of the output. So we save AX and DL by pushing them to the stack. And when everything is done, we restore them. But since we can't push 8-bit registers to the stack, we push the whole DX and when we pop, we only restore DL. Finally, we can return from this method. Next, we will write a method that reads from a disk. As parameters, we will have the logical block address into AX, CL will contain the number of sectors to read, DL will point to the drive number, and ESBX will point to a memory location where we will store the data. The first thing we need to do is call our conversion function. But since the function will overwrite the contents of CX, which contains the number of sectors to read, we should save it first, by pushing it to the stack. Let's quickly look at the function we want to call, the read sectors from drive function, and check all the parameters. The cylinder, sector, head, drive and memory destination should already be set. All that's left to do is set the number of sectors to read in AL and 0 to hexadecimal in AH. The sector count is saved to the stack, so we pop it into AX and then we set AH. But now we can call the interrupt 13H. In a virtual environment this should work perfectly, but unfortunately in the real world floppy disks tend to be pretty unreliable. To address that, the documentation recommends us to retry the read operation at least three times. So let's add that. First, let's set the number of times we want to retry in a register that we haven't used yet, DI, and then begin a loop. We don't really know what registers the BIOS interrupt will overwrite, so we save all of them to the stack using push A. There is also another quirk of some BIOSes, that they don't properly set the carry flag, so we set it ourselves. This is how we can check the result of the operation. If the carry flag is cleared, that means that the operation has succeeded, so we can jump out of the loop. Now we can restore the registers using POP A. If the operation failed, we need to reset the floppy controller, 
so we will write a method to do that. Next, we decrement di and check the loop condition. If di is not yet zero, we jump back to the beginning of the loop. If we exit the loop, that means that all of our attempts have been exhausted and the operation still failed. So we will jump to another place, which will simply display an error message and stop the brute process. To make it nicer, I call this code that calls interrupt 16h with the function 0, which waits for a key press, after which I jump to the address fff0000, which is where the bio starts, effectively rebooting the system. As a last thing, I save the registers that were modified to the stack and restore them before returning. The disk reset method is really simple, it only has one parameter, the drive number in DL. All we need to do is call interrupt 13H with the AH register set to zero, this will reset the disk controller. If the operation fails, just like before, we jump to the same floppy error label that prints the error message. After writing all this code, let's give it a try and see if it works. Let's go back to the main function and try to read some data from the disk. The BIOS should set the drive number from which it loaded our bootloader in the DL register. I use that useless field that we talked about earlier to store its value. Then I set up the call of the disk read function to read the second sector with LBA1. Now let's compile and run our code. I kept forgetting the command line for running the VM, so I decided to create a run.sh shell script, which simply contains the camel command. And it looks like we have a problem. The hello world message doesn't appear anymore, so there is a bug somewhere. I think now would be a great time to introduce another extremely useful tool, which is called Box. This is basically an emulator and debugger for an x86 processor and we can use it to debug our bootloader. To get it running we need to create the configuration file. First I set it to emulate the computer with 128 megs of RAM. Then I gave it the path to the ROM and the VGA ROM images. Then I configure the floppy A drive to contain our disk image with the status inserted. Right now we don't need any mouse support, so I disabled it. I set the display library to SDL with the option of the GUI debugger. Box also has a command line debugger, but I prefer the GUI. To run Box, I created another shell script, debug.sh, which calls box with the configuration file we just created. When I tried to run box, I encountered some issues. First of all, it wasn't installed on my machine. In addition to the box package, I also needed to install box SDL for the UI, box BIOS and VGA BIOS, which contain the ROMs. After that, I encountered another error that the display library SDL wasn't available. The fix for the issue was to set the display library to SDL2 instead of SDL. And now we see the box interface. It's not very pretty, but we can work with it and it's gonna help us a lot. Okay, so let's get the, everything ready. So I'm going to have the code somewhere so we can see it 
like this and the display window and now the debugging window okay so now box has started and it has set a breakpoint right at the beginning of the bios what we're going to do is we're going to go to view disassemble and in this window we are going to put 7c00 7c00 is the address where our bootloader will be loaded so we are going to double click it this will create a breakpoint and the box will stop when it gets here so now let's continue okay so this doesn't look valid to me so let's go ahead and disassemble again and now this is correct so this would be the jump short start instruction now step so what happened here the current instruction highlight has disappeared well that's not something to worry about because we have to go back to view disassemble and the new address is also the same one as in the IP register. And let's go there. Okay. So now we have reached this jump instruction. Let's scroll down and see what happens after this jump of ours. So we should be at the start label and at the jump main instruction. So let's go one more step. And now we are in the main label. Okay, let's scroll down to the main label. And now we can recognize the code. So let's go step by step and see what is happening. First, we just set up a few registers and we wrote this uh, into the memory. And then we are calling the discrete method. Uh, the parameters look okay. Now here you can see all the registers. We don't have the AX and BX registers, but we have EAX and EBX and ECX. This is nothing to worry about because in modern processors, these uh, registers are actually extended and now they're 32 bit, not 16 bit. In order to just see the value of the AX register, for example, we just need to look at the last four digits over here. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, now we are have reached this call to the discrete method. So let's step and we can go to the discrete method right now. First, we have pushed a few things to the stack. So let's skip over those. And now we are calling this LBA2CHS method. So let's step into it and see what happens. Okay. So first we pushed some stuff to the stack. Uh, we can also see the stack by going to view linear memory dump and we have to add here the address. In our case, the top of the stack is 7BEC, so we can do that. 7C, 7BEC and press OK. And now we see the value of the stack. So now this is the logic that performs the LBA to CHS conversion. First, we set the DX register to zero, and then we want to divide the LBA address by the number of sectors per track. In our case, AX is one. So one divided by the sectors per track, which is 18, that will give us the result zero and the remainder will be one. So that is the case here you can see dx is one ax is zero okay now we are increasing dx to calculate the sector and now we have the sector which is two and it, we moved it to cx we don't care about these first four digits just the last four so we have two set to cx okay now we have the second division The, value the values are zero. So we can see that dx and ax are zero. And we have the logic that puts everything into the right registers. And we can see the cx register is just two. The h is zero and the cylinder is zero. 
now we are popping the registers that we have pushed so we are restoring dl to its previous value okay so dl is now zero and we are returning back to where we came from so now we are going back to the discrete method and we have reached this pop x now let's go on so now we are preparing to call the 13h interrupt so let's see what happens there okay so we have all the parameters ready if we look into the documentation all the parameters should match now we have reached this interrupt 13 instruction if i click on step it will take me into the BIOS where the int 13 interrupt is actually handled. We don't really care about that. We just want to see the result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a breakpoint just after this interrupt and I'm going to press continue. And now we have reached this place. This was the jump if not carry to the down label. And it looks like it jumped so it means that the operation succeeded and now we have reached this done label and now we are popping all the registers that we have pushed and here i found the mistake so instead of popping the i the x and so on we have pushed them we can fix that really easily and let me show you what happens if you mess up the stack so let's go and skip these instructions and now we have reached this return and if we click on step, now we are at address 00201. What is this? I mean, this is not where we should be. So what is happening here is that the return instruction expects the return address to be at the top of the stack. But because we pushed instead of popping, the top of the stack contains something else, not the return address. The return instruction is simply interpreting whatever it finds as the return address which is why we ended up at the address 200 hexadecimal. So let's fix it and see what happens. Okay, so now that we have learned what the problem was, we can actually stop box, make, and now we can run using the run command we have created. And we have hello world and then read from disk field. Now I think I know what is happening here. So it's not stopping. That's the issue here. So yeah, so we are just calling halt without stopping the interrupts, without disabling interrupts. So whenever something happens, like the clock ticks, or we move the mouse, or we press a key, the processor is interrupted. If we just hold without disabling interrupts, the processor can still get out of this hold, and it can still continue executing, even though we have told it to stop. So that's why we need to disable these interrupts. So that's what we're going to do, and that should solve this issue. Okay, so let's just make and run. And now we are seeing the hello world message. Unfortunately, we cannot see if the read operation has actually succeeded. Now let's go back and use box again. Okay, now we can continue. And we have reached a hold instruction. I'm not really sure why nothing is being displayed here. Uh, maybe something's wrong with my configuration. So let's break. Now go to view, linear memory dump. Let's set the address to 7E00, which is where we read the data. And now let's open the hex editor. And I'm going to open the floppy image. And let's go to address 200 and see. And this looks like it matches to what we have read. This means that the read is working properly. Success! With this we have reached the end of part 2. 
Before you go, let me show you the Nanobyte GitHub page where you can find all the source code that we have worked on. I will put the link in the description below. In part 3 we will talk about the FAT12 file system and how to read the files of our disk. Thank you for watching and if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Bye!